the winning right there. So most of you know I have a daughter with Down syndrome, and one of my favorite things is to take her to school and watch her hug everybody as they came into class, and then watch other students just walk by each other. And I thought, these kids know how to do it. They got it down. So years ago, today we're going to talk about from worst to first. Let me read these verses first. We're going to go to Romans chapter 8 today. I'm going to just give you a couple verses, and I'm going to tell you a story. A couple stories. But let me read Romans 8, 31, and then verse 36. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then a few verses later it says this. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I don't know if you ever feel like a failure, and I don't know what your definition of success is. Um, about 11 years ago, we got a new definition of success from this guy. And this has become a meme. Here's what's interesting about it is the kids who are posting this meme were four years old when this happened. Now, that'll freak you out. And yet they're posting. And if it, those of you who don't know who this is, this is Charlie Sheen. At this point in his life, he was making $2 million per episode for a show called Two and a Half Men. But he was also arrested for domestic violence. He also was struggling with drug addiction, all kind of other issues. And when he had an interview and they asked him about those things, his comment was, oh, you think I'm not doing well? I'm winning. And he said, and he said uh, winning. And so actually what's been funny is in the culture that's become, a, every once in a while, you'll hear it still, 10, 11 years later, you'll hear people go, uh, winning, and here's the problem. His definition is wrong, but I'm going to mess with you a little bit. Your definition could be just as bad as his. You may not look as crazy, hopefully. By the way, I tried to get the crazy. Randy said, use that one. That's perfect, because we, we had a few pictures of him. And I like, here's what's funny. I like Charlie Sheen. But at this point in his life, can I tell you something? He was not winning, but he thought he was. So here's my question for you. Are you? Because here's the thing. Let me give you a couple questions real quick while Charlie Sheen stares at us for a minute. <laughs> what is your definition of winning? Is it likes on Facebook for your last post? Is it a popular TikTok? You may not even know what TikTok is, but maybe somebody today will. You got to be under 20, I think, to know what a TikTok is. Is it money? The amount of money that's in your bank account? How much money you're making at work? Uh, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's, hey, my man, I, as long as I have a good relationship with my family, what if you lose them tomorrow? If it's money, what if, what if you lose that tomorrow? Are you still winning? Are, are you still victor? What if you lose all these things? Some of you, because you're good Christians, you say, no, no, no. It's when I spend time in God's word or when I'm driving in traffic and I don't cuss at somebody, then I'm winning. And if I cuss at somebody, I'm losing. Is that how it works? Is that the definition? If you're a good person and you do nice things, you're winning. And if you get, have a bad day and you're grumpy, then you're losing. Is that your definition? See, the problem with most of our definitions are of winning and what success is, is they're very fickle. If our political party wins, we think, oh, well, we're successful. And if our political party loses, we think, oh, we're a failure. Please quit allowing the news to tell you what success is. Your politician will not save you. Your politician is not going to take you to heaven. And your politician, no matter how perfect, is very flawed. And by the way, when the news talks about how flawed politicians are, here should be your reaction be. Yeah. <laughs> no matter who they talk about, whether it's somebody you like or somebody you hate, when they say it, you shouldn't be like, oh, I can't believe they did that. It should be, well, yeah, they're, they're a politician. That's pretty much. And if... You hear that your pastor cut somebody off in traffic. <laughs> somebody came to me one day and said, I saw you run a red light. What was funny is I was not even where they said I ran a red light. But they believed it was me running a red light. To which I said, that wasn't me. Not that I've never run a red light. <laughs> but your response should not be, oh no, my pastor. It should be, yeah. <laughs> not that I want to do that. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not pursuing a life of... Of bad driving. It does happen. But I'm not a pursuit. And we've talked about that a little bit. So let me ask you this. How can you go through difficulty? Because the truth is for most of us. 
Winning is if life is easy and losing is if life is hard. Winning is if we're getting what we want or whatever we think success is. Losing is if we're not. So if winning is our family relationships, we're doing great until it's not going well. If winning's our health, oh boy. Right? If winning's our likes on Facebook, oh, you're really... And by the way, most of us go, oh, I can't believe people do that, to whatever thing is not ours. What do you consider winning? If you know Christ, the Bible says not only are you a winner, it says you're more than a winner. More than a winner. Because you are his child. So today we're going to talk about three, and we're going to get Charlie Sheen off the screen. We're going to talk about three steps. Thank you for leaving that there because it was perfect. It just kind of aggravated everybody for like 10 minutes. Three steps. I really wanted you to do that. It was great. Three steps to deal with difficulty. And we're going to Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite passages in Romans. This, this chapter is the pinnacle of Romans. It's awesome. There's so much in here. I could do a series on this chapter, but we're not. This chapter is the idea, he's talked to the Jews, he's talked to the Gentiles, and it's the idea that the, the curtain has been torn. And you, in the New Testament, you don't, you don't just go through life and when you mess up, you've got to get an animal sacrifice, you've got to kill one of those cute sheep. Or a cow, now that sounds good, hamburger, it's good. Right? And, and, but now what happens? You have fellowship with God. He is with you. It is a totally different way of looking at life. And so New Testament, Christian winning is God's presence in your life. And what Paul didn't know, and what the people he's writing to in Rome didn't know, that right at this time, the Roman Christians had it pretty easy. I mean, Jewish Christians were starting to come back to Rome, and they were dealing with how those people can get along, but it wouldn't be long till this guy, Nero, was going to take office. And when Nero took office, all of a sudden, if your name was somehow associated with Christians, they were going to hunt you down, and you were going to become a torch in town. Literally. It's awful to hear what Nero did to early Christians. That's just a few years from this writing. Paul, even without knowing the future, was preparing them for what really mattered in life. So here's the first part. Are you willing, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to surrender? Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 1 through 6. By the way, some of these verses are going to be like, oh, I've heard that one. Oh, I've heard that one. Therefore, there is now a little bit of condemnation. No, there is now, what's the word? Oh, let's try that again like your children took a cookie that was your favorite. Ready? One, two, three. No. Oh, you would do it better than that, okay? I'm going to go out to your car with my key, and I'm going to scratch your car. And here I come, and you say? No. So much better. Thank you. All right, there. I thought I could get to you somewhere. All right, therefore, Peggy's like, I wish you'd scratch it because... I've got mine in the shop. All right. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Time out. Some of you are condemning yourself. Some of you are the ones condemning yourself. Some of you are allowing other people to condemn you. Some of you are allowing something you heard in your childhood con con to condemn you. That person can't hurt you anymore unless you let them. How do I know that? Because he says there's now no condemnation for those who are, I love this, in Christ Jesus. Not just around him. You're, you're in him. It's awesome. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's performance. Performance. Some of you, by the way, gave your life to Christ. You gave it to him knowing that he freely accepted you. And now you think you have to earn his love. So when you do something wrong, you think, well, God doesn't love me as much today. I blew it. We confess our sins. He is faithful. By the way, the Bible doesn't say you are faithful. Because you're not. There's times that you mess up. You blow it. You think the wrong thing. You say the wrong thing. You take Sudafed and get all wound up. That's what I did this morning. 
For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. This is the great exchange. God required payment for sin, and so he sent Jesus to take our place. It doesn't make sense to our 20th century American mind where we don't even have to get our own chicken. We go to Publix, and they've already done everything, and we take it home, and we're still grossed out by it and wash our hands 42 times because we're afraid of salmonella. My friends who lived in the Philippines, when they went to make chicken, this is how they did it. They went to a lady in town, and they said, I'll take that one, and she went like this and handed it to them. So this idea of sacrifice to us is so foreign as Americans, you need to realize this is the great exchange. God took your place, and then it continues. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. We all know what the flesh desires. Comfort, selfishness, self-centeredness, pleasure, no pain. Wouldn't life just be great if there was no pain? Yeah, that's called heaven. Not there yet. One day you'll be there. You're not there. You groan. This verse, later in this chapter, we're not going to read it today. It says, we groan. (laughs) Been there. Got up this morning after lifting some heavy stuff yesterday for a concert. Got up this morning and went, oh. <laughs> but those who live in according with the Spirit <clears throat> have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Why? Because when you're only thinking about the flesh, you're seeking pleasure, satisfaction, and no pain. And guess what? You're always going to be disappointed. Always. Always. I don't care if you get everything that you have on your list that you think is winning. You'll still be disappointed. But when you live in the Spirit and you understand that that God loves you no matter what happens around you and even in you, you know you know Him. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. And then it continues a few verses later. For those who are led by the Spirit... Of God, I love this, are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. You're worried. God's going to punish me all the time. Oh, no. Nay, nay. Look out. Oh, God's wrath. No, not any longer. Why not? Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. I have an adopted daughter. I don't know if you know that. She looks a little different than me because she's from Taiwan. Every once in a while when we meet somebody, they'll say to her, are you adopted? And I will say, no, she looks like her dad. Can't you tell? (laughs) Which she thinks is hilarious, by the way. Now, my children, I have a deal with them. As long as they're in school, they get gas money. They drive the world, I think, now. But I don't say to my son, hey, you get more gas money than your sister because she's adopted. Nay, nay. They get the same. They get the same love. They get the same acceptance. They get the same hugs. Well, she doesn't like hugs. But, you know, the same, right? Germs. She's worried about germs. I saw contagion. I'm worried about germs. All good. And then it says this. And by him we cry... By him we cry, the next verse, by him we cry, Abba, Father. By him we cry, Abba, Father. That word Abba, it's really cool. It means daddy. Now, I remember in the 70s, a hippie in our church, and he would pray instead of dear father, he would say daddy, and the deacons would get mad. I can't believe he's saying daddy. And as a kid, I remember thinking, yeah, that's pretty gutsy. Kind of in the Bible. I dare you at home, maybe don't do it in public because people just think you're weird, but I dare you at home to pray to God as daddy. It's biblical. It's what Jesus said. Abba, daddy. It's, It's a term of endearment. It's a closeness. Yes, I understand that God's our father and there's this reverence, but Paul also reminds us that there's this closeness. When you want something from your dad, you don't say, Father. I always joke with my kids because they come to me and they want something. And they do that as a joke. They'll come to me and say, Father. 
May I please have the gas card, Father? Get out of here. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are, listen, listen, God's children. When's the last time you really recognized that and surrendered to that? Quit trying to, to, to feel like somehow you're earning God's love and just said, God, thank you that you love me. Because here's the deal. When you think you're performing to earn God's love, you will expect everyone else to perform. When you, when you think, I'm going to perform and God will love me more if I perform the way he wants me to, then you'll look at other people and expect them to perform. And no one will want to be around you. <laughs> if we're not careful, we put ourselves and we think, well, i got to earn God's love. If you begin to receive God's love, guess what? You're going to be able to give grace to other people. You're, you're going to love people that don't agree with you. Did you know that? Now try that one in our, our, economy, in our, uh, our present state of life. So the first thing I want, to do, I want you to do, I want you to ponder. I want you to set your mind on surrender and not selfishness. Why? Because selfishness is all about flesh. And you can figure out if you're in the flesh real quick when you start to grit your teeth. Or when all you can think about is no pain, just pleasure. When you don't want to sacrifice for anybody else. By the way, when you help people, can I tell you a secret? It's hard. You help people and they complain. I'm helping you. What are you complaining about? Because they're human too. So if you're trying to please them, you're not, you've got to surrender. Now, I'm not saying to enable people. I'm not saying if my kids come to me and are jerk to me that I'm going to give them gas money. Because they're my children and I'm in charge of discipline, right? Not always very well, but I'm in charge, right? Do you remember that game Mercy when you were a kid? If you never played it, it's a horrible, mean, terrible game, which I was good at. And you basically grab somebody's hands and you bend them back and you will not stop until they say the word mercy. 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 Sounds like Elvis. Too many times we wait until we're so miserable to finally say, God, I surrender. In the middle of life, sometimes we just need to say, God, I surrender. I surrender the good times and the bad times, the tough things and the easy times. And here's the thing. When you're going through difficulty, one of the best things you can learn is to realize I'm not in control. I know all of us men think we're in control. Especially when we're driving. We think we are. <laughs> Somebody's wife laughed a little too loud. So willing to surrender. Number two, <clears throat> waiting for the reward. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you love to wait? It's your favorite thing. You just love. If you raise your hand. Nobody raise their hand. Good. No liars in this room. Now, I'm from a third generation of bad drivers. There are stories when traffic lights only had two colors and they were first put in and there was no air conditioning in cars of the light turning green, barely green, and my grandfather out the window going, go. Now, that's a hundred-year-old story. I still know it. The other day, I'm sitting at a light in Orlando, which I just love. God's teaching me. How to, how to be patient. So I'm sitting at a light. There are four cars in front of me. This light is forever. It takes a week to change. The arrow turns green. The guy is texting somebody or napping. I start counting the cars that are going. One. The second person, I guess, was napping too. Two, I have to stop and sit through the light again. Oh. Eric, how did you suffer for Jesus? Well, I drove in traffic in Orlando. Right? And then it came back to me. As a child in Miami, I remember sitting on US-1. I think it was Bird Road. Had a huge light, left turn light. And I remember sitting at that light and hearing my dad going, one, 
two, three. Counting the cars that were going. I was trained in this. I am the third generation that thinks that somehow I can control other drivers by counting. By the way, if you don't think you have this problem, if you get in line at Publix and you check to see who's in the same place in line, you have the same problem. And if they beat you out of the store and you're upset about it, guess what? One. You're just like me. If you're going through the line and you feel victorious because your line's winning. And then you realize the person in front of you is a couponer. Your standards are wrong, right? I've been there. Nobody likes waiting, but here's the deal. We have to wait for the reward. Heaven's not now. Success is not about how much money you have or if you get the the front parking space. It's not about how many likes you get on Facebook. It's not how many TikTok likes you have. It's not whether your friends think you dress cool or don't. It's not whether you have a lot of friends or a few friends. The reward is coming. It's not whether you struggle with physical health or even mental health. That's not what success is. Listen to what Paul says. I consider our present sufferings. You ever feel like you're presently suffering? By the way, most of us feel like we're suffering until we talk to somebody who's really suffering. I consider... This light's just awful. I'm just suffering. Right? Right? You wouldn't believe it. I went to Publix and I got a couponer in front of me. Ooh. Right? Do you see how our standards are different? I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing what? With the glory to be revealed in us. Now that's what's awesome. Not just heaven. In us. God's going, I see good stuff. It's like, really? I don't. He's like, no, no. For the creation waits an eager expectation of the children of God to be revealed. And then a few verses later, it talks about groaning. And then in a few verses later, it says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Isn't that good news? We do not know how we even ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. And if you haven't had one of those prayers, you've never struggled with pain before. You ready for a prayer? That can be a prayer. Now that can be focusing on you or it can be focusing on God. God, help me deal with this thing. You have a teenager? You're going to make that noise once in a while. Because they just made that noise. And then it makes you make that noise. And then it continues. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people accordance with the will of God. Hey, can I encourage you not to just pray, but sometimes ask God to lead you how to pray? Not just to rush through prayer time, but to say, God, show me what to pray for. I I can't tell you the number of times I've looked at somebody or thought about somebody or in my prayer time have somebody's name. And and even though I have a prayer request written down, I say, God, how do you want me to pray for them? And I pray totally different than I would ever pray. And so often I follow up with that person. They say, how did you know that? How how did you know I was dealing with that? And I go, because I'm smart. And then they laugh. Ha, ha, ha. And I go, no, 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 I was just praying. I felt like I was supposed to. That they agreed with. The smart one, they never agree with. We thought you were in our house. No, no, just your wife told me. No, they didn't. All right. And we know in all things, you probably heard this verse before, God works for the good. By the way, it doesn't say everything's good, does it? But he works it for the good, for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Isn't that cool? You get to be a brother and a sister of God. It's awesome thought. It's very different. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. It means God justified you. What does it mean? Just as if you never sinned. But you're like, Eric, you have no idea. I sinned on the way here. I sinned while you were talking. When you talked about that one story, I sat here and thought, you're a doofus, right? I sinned while you're here. You don't understand. No, but the Bible says God justified. Why? Because of your works? No, no. Because of your faith in him. He justified you and he will glorify you. What does that mean? He's going to raise you up. He's going to show you all the good. He's going to pour all good things into you. So here's the second thing. So the first one was, I ponder, I set my mind on surrender. Number two, I'm positive. I am sure this difficulty will work out for my good. 
There's a guy who felt like he was going to die, and he said, I'm going to die. And his friend said, be more positive. He said, I'm sure I'm going to (laughs) die. Being positive is about understanding that God's in control regardless of what happens next. So even if you're in a hospital bed, not sure what's happening next, even if one of your friends is in a hospital bed and you're not sure what's going to happen next, if you're dealing with a financial struggle, an emotional struggle, you say, God, I know you can work even this horrible thing out for the good. When somebody attacks you unfairly, when you lose a job for a reason that wasn't your own, when you're evaluated at work for something that you didn't do, when somebody blames you for somebody else's problem and it's totally unfair, you can say, God, I know you're going to even work this out for good. But Eric, you don't understand. It has to do with my family. God can even work that out for good. But Eric, this isn't good. No, what you're dealing with is not good. It means that person that hurt you, what they did is not good. God doesn't say it's good, but he says, I can even use that hurt for you to be a blessing to somebody else. So willing to surrender, waiting for the reward, finally winning at life. I had a professor named Dr. Don Wilton when I was in seminary. The guy worked for the Billy Graham crusade and they were in Scotland And they had a dinner one night, and he got to sit next to the former head of Scotland Yard and talk to him. So there was a guy on Billy Graham's staff who did not like Don Wilton. And he came to Don one day, and he said, hey, just want you to know, tomorrow we're going into Scottish Parliament, and you're not invited. But you can come and watch us walk in with the dignitaries. So Don thought, well, at least I can go there. So Don Wilton went that next morning. Now, this was before 9-11. You're going to discover why I say that in just a minute. So Don Wilton went, and here comes Billy Graham and his entourage. And Don is not invited, but Don is standing there. And as they pass, he said, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I jumped in line. He said, and as we went past all these people, they all had credentials. And I did not, but they didn't look. He said, I went all the way in. We got upstairs in Parliament, which is kind of like um, the upstairs in Congress, where you sit upstairs and you watch what's going on. And so they went upstairs. And as he gets to the row, there's no seat for him because he wasn't invited. But he notices that in the row in front of him, there's a seat. So he doesn't know what to do. So he goes and sits down and he sits where he can see Billy Graham and his entourage. So he sits down. He said, it's the most comfortable chair he ever sat in. It was unbelievable. Now, I used to think this was a fake story. He wrote it in his book and wrote all the names of all the people involved. He said he looked across and he noticed all the cameras were on him. And he said, and then he noticed that one of the officers from Scotland Yard started walking down and looking at him. And he said, I couldn't help but look, but keep looking, looking, looking at him, looking at him. He said, it was like, I was like, I'm guilty. And all of a sudden, The guy says, sir, and Don Wilton said his heart stopped. He knew, I'm going to jail. They're going to put me in the tower. This is the end. He said, sir, who are you with? Right then, the former head of Scotland Yard walked out, looked over and said, it's okay. He's with me. He said, okay. He said, well, sir, could you at least move out of the queen's seat? True story. <laughs> I would have gone to jail. I'm just saying I would have gone. That would have been, you guys would be visiting me now. Like, I don't know why you did it. I don't know either. I just jumped in line. It was there. I love when another pastor's ADD besides me and just jumps in line, by the way. So here's the deal. He's with me. He said, when I get to heaven, that's exactly what's going to happen. I get to heaven and God goes, well, you deserve to be here. Or, you know, we have all these angels jokes. Why do you deserve to be here? And God's going to go. And Jesus is going to step out and go, no, no, it's okay. He's with me. Listen to what it says in the Bible. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us a couple of things? All things, just like my kids, right? Who will bring any charge against those whose God has chosen? Is God 
It is God who justifies. And then later it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? We feel like it, right? Or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He didn't know how true that was going to be just a few years later. No, in all these things, listen to this, we're more than winners. Not just winners, you're more than conquerors. Why? Through him who loved us. For I'm convinced neither death nor life, angels or demons, present or future or powers, height, depth, anything in creation, your biggest frustration right now will not separate you from God. Will be able to separate us, what? From the love of God that is in Jesus our Lord. I proclaim, I am not a victim, I'm a conqueror. Why? Because I'm with Him. So even when you sit in the wrong seat, and even when you do the wrong thing, and even when you struggle, and even when you're frustrated over things that don't really matter, and even when you stand in line at Publix and you lose, and you're at the light and you catch it twice, wah, wah, or one of your children rebels, or your spouse decides to leave you, or all the money's gone. Or you get fired for no reason. Or you get in a car accident and it was somebody else's fault. Or you lose a good friend who you loved. Regardless of all that, you are victorious. Why? Because he's with you. Regardless of what happens. Regardless of what happens next. Regardless of whether the people who've always loved you reject you. Regardless of whether you're mad at yourself all the time and you fail and falter when you surrender your life to him, you are victorious. That's how you can go through difficulty. If you know him, you're more than a winner. You are his child. So receive that love today. Realize that in life, when it seems like you lose, you're actually still winning. Those days that are terrible and nothing goes right, you're still his child. And do you deserve it? No. You know, sometimes I go home Sunday afternoons and I'm so discouraged. And here's why. Because I think, I can't believe you said that. You said that out loud. You meant to hold that in. And I beat myself up. And then God shows up every time and says, it's okay. I can use you anyway. And that's true for you too. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, that's the first step to victory. God, I want to know you. I want to be your child. You can surrender your life to him today. So if you want to do that today, I encourage you to come up after the service. We don't do a formal invitation where people come up, but you can come up later and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and the truth is one of those things I talked about was you. You know what? Give it to God. God, help me to quit focusing on the wrong things for victory and understand that you're my daddy. You're Abba. You love me because he loves you today. I so appreciate you guys, all that you do. Dave, we appreciate you every week, all you do. I've given you a hard time this morning, but we really do. We're so grateful. And I'm thankful for a group of people that encourages others into the life that God has for them, regardless of their background, their hurts, their struggles. So I encourage you to do that today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace for us. Lord, thank you that when we feel like failures, when we feel frustrated in life, that, Lord, you said you've given us the victory. Lord, I pray when we focus on petty things that don't matter, and, Lord, even when we focus on big things in our lives, that, Father, we'd realize it's not about that. But even in those times, we're your children. You love us. You've torn the veil apart. We can have a relationship with you. And Lord, when we have a relationship with you, I thank you that through your spirit, you cause us to be friends. You unite our hearts. Lord, bless each one here today. And I pray for anyone here watching online or here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that they become your children adopted by you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have our time of giving.